So hello everyone, my name is Ellie Raber. I'm with Pacific Community Ventures, businessadvising.org. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar on uh, tricks and tips for the best commercial lease. Your, your lease is your asset and obligation. Uh, today we're joined by Lisa Zahner, who's the Executive Director of Urban Solutions, one of our partner organizations, and they specialize um, in retail lease negotiation, Etc. She will walk you through all of that. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, everybody is being recorded uh, right now. That way we can post this online later. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, session at the end of today. Uh, Lisa's nice enough to stick around. Uh, there is a Q&A tab on your screen. Feel free to go ahead and uh, ask any questions you want. And at the end, Lisa and I will uh, go through those. Um, Everyone is muted, and that is just so we don't hear any, any background noise. A little bit about business advising. Uh, like I said, we're a program of Pacific Community Ventures. We are a small business accelerator that matches small business owners with volunteer expert advisors to work on your targeted business needs. Uh, we also have a loan program here in California uh, where we lend 10,000 to 200,000 to borrowers who are often turned down by traditional banks. So a little bit about our speaker today. Uh, Lisa Zahner is the Executive Director of Urban Solutions, a community-based nonprofit organization that provides small businesses and entrepreneurs with the tools they need to thrive in competitive markets. Among other services, and what she's going to speak about today, is that Urban Solutions is a licensed California real estate brokerage. They help small businesses find retail spaces, and they work with tenants and landlords to secure fair, viable commercial leases that enable businesses to grow and thrive. So with that, Lisa, I'm going to mute myself, stop my video and then pass control over to you. And we appreciate you sharing your insight with us today. Super, thank you. All right, let's, uh, now let me try to get control over here and uh, then we will get started. Okay, this is where I need my 14 year old uh, to help me out. So uh, if I ever need any assistance, Ellie's going to give me a hand, but I think we're going to be set. So first of all, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, I'm just delighted that you are here, and um, talking about real estate and helping to find your space is one of my favorite things. So um, let me uh, get started, and we'll tell you a little bit about uh, Urban Solutions and uh, where we go. You know, Ellie, I'm trying to get this to turn to the next slide, and there we go. Thank you so much. So as Ellie said, uh, Urban Solutions is a nonprofit organization. We've been around for almost 25 years. Uh, we help small businesses to open, grow, and thrive. And we focus our efforts in developing neighborhoods. So neighborhoods uh, here in San Francisco, such as the Central Market uh, and Tenderloin areas, Sixth uh, Street, other underserved areas, such as the Lower Fillmore area, um, and then outer neighborhoods as well. Our whole goal is to help the small businesses in these underserved neighborhoods to grow and to be viable uh, because we believe that not only does that uh, contribute to the economic self-sufficiency of the family and the employees of those small businesses, but it contributes to the economic self-sufficiency, diversity, and sustainability of the neighborhood itself. Everybody deserves to live in a great neighborhood um, with a thriving retail corridor, and we do everything that we can to help to make that happen. At Urban Solutions, in addition to providing commercial leasing services, uh, we also help small businesses to uh, access capital through loan packaging, um, through our partners here also at PCV. We also provide one-to-one -one business consulting. Um, we help folks with um, access to legal advice, to referrals, to how to get through the permitting process in the city. And then we also have uh, business education workshops, uh, including uh, tech training for how you can use uh, new technology to help your small business to uh, gain better efficiencies and increase revenues, as well as a special program for uh, it's called Enterprising Women for Low-Income Women of Color who have their businesses and how they can uh, grow their businesses uh, to be more, um, more resilient and, uh, and, and uh, create greater revenue and, and economic self-sufficiency for themselves and their families. Ellie, could you switch the next slide, please? Let's see here. No? It looks like, here we go. 
there we go. I just told you everything about urban solutions. Um, so we're going to go now to the next slide. So folks wonder, you know, really, what is a lease? You know, it, it's, it's easy to talk about and say, oh, you know, I'm getting the lease here, I'm renting this space here. But what's really important is to recognize that a lease is a legally binding agreement between two parties, between the tenant and the landlord. Um, it provides certain rights to the tenant, and it also outlines the terms of the agreement. Um, it's very, very, very important that you always have your lease in writing, uh, because when you have something in writing, then you know you can't go back to the he said, she said. Um, and, uh, and so one of the things that we always do is say, well, when you have your lease, remember this is your legally binding agreement, and put everything in writing first. Let's go to the next slide. So why is your lease important? Um, your lease is important because it's, it's like the foundation to your business or the foundation to your house, right? It provides a physical place and a physical space where you can be. It provides your business with financial security. Um, you know what your monthly rent is. You know at the end of your lease term what are your options that you could extend your lease if those options are available to you and at what terms. It allows you to recoup the uh, investments that you have made in your improvements in your space. And so your lease protects the longevity of that investment. And additionally, from a community standpoint, from a commercial corridor standpoint, uh, your lease is important because it contributes to the overall business mix in a community. You know, we have all seen, um, you know, and experienced what happens when you lose your favorite hardware store or, you know, when you lose that auto repair shop that you and your family have been going to for 35 years. You know, when folks do not have a strong lease and when you lose those businesses that um, are key to you, your family, your community, you know, you really feel the impact of losing the diversity of that business mix. So if the foundation is weak of your lease, you know, it can impact your business's ability to grow and thrive. It impacts your ability to make plans. Oh, could you go back to the, for, to the slide right before there? Nope. Here we go. It's the other one that says, um, you know, a lease in an ideal situation is a win-win for both the tenant and the landlord. Each party needs to feel like they're getting a fair deal. Um, you know, my dad always said to me that good beginnings make good finishes. So when you know that you have a good lease and you have everything that uh, is in writing and people feel good about it, both the landlord and the tenant, then you have a mutually respectful relationship. And that's very, very important for your business. Can you uh, now go to Mama Nurture, please, Ellie? So Mama Nurture is a case study. Uh, this is me in these pictures, and uh, that's my son who, uh, he's in the lower corner there. Uh, he now has green hair and goes to high school. So about 14 years ago, um, I used to be a management consultant. And after um, I had my son and realized that they're equivalent of a nursing room and providing support for uh, moms with new children was to put you in the room where the leftover printers were and the broken chairs, I said, you know, there's got to be a different life. There's got to be something better than, you know, me, my laptop, my breast pump, and my baby, uh, you know, on the plane to go and try to close another deal selling enterprise-wide software. So pretty much on a whim, I started Mama Nurture. Mama Nurture was a retail store on West 83rd Street in New York City where we lived. And there was this, um, an empty storefront that was only used every once in a while by a woman who threw parties. And I approached her and I said, you know, I've got this great idea. You know, I want to start a new store for parents and that it's going to be a community space and I'll sell baby slings and, um, you know, organic uh, products for babies and sexy nursing bras, like a black lace nursing bra. And people were very excited about all this. Um, and we had um, baby massage classes and it was just wonderful. The problem was um, I was subleasing my space from her. I was so excited to get started that I rushed into um, finding my space and getting open without really doing all of my homework. So a couple months down the road, uh, when the lady who lived downstairs would stand outside with her scary big Rottweiler and shout at my pregnant ladies and new moms, hey, every time you sit on the toilet, it's leaking onto my piano. 
and all the babies would cry. Um, or when uh, people would come by and they would have threatening messages to leave for the woman I was subleasing the space from, I thought, gosh, you know, this really is not going very well. I had all of my uh, clients who were super happy and, you know, we were going smoothly until one day I showed up and found out that the sheriff had uh, chained the door and put a three-day notice to quit or cure uh, on the door. And it turns out that the woman that I had subleased the space from um, was taking my money but not paying the rent. And as a result of that, I lost my space. Um, I lost my space because I had rushed into this agreement with her without doing my homework and without having a lease in place that protected me, I'm sorry, a sublease in place that protected me uh, in case she defaulted. And in fact, she did default. And so in the middle of a snowstorm, um, I had to pack everything up and put it all into storage. And uh, it was a really, really hard, sad experience. Um, and it's really one of the reasons why I wound up working in this um, business was because whereas that was a very costly um, experience, both in terms of the money that I lost in um, opening up this retail space and then buying all of my product and then having to sell everything in a fire sale or throw it all into storage, um, there was also a huge psychological loss. And, uh, and, and I felt great sadness at having opened up my space and having welcomed all of my customers in my community only to lose it uh, because I did not have a strong lease to begin with. We see this all the time with small businesses. And it's really vital and important that you have a written agreement that is legally binding that protects you and your business so that you can stay in business, so that you are not subject to the whims of somebody else um, who perhaps is not working in an ethical way or, um, you know, so that you're not protected. Could you switch, please, Eli? Thanks. So here you see, a good lease is fair and a win-win for both the business owner and the landlord. And in this case, the lease that I had, the sublease, was great for the woman who was taking my money, um, but it certainly wasn't great for me. Okay, next slide, please. Here are factors that you want to consider uh, when you are entering into a lease. Really think about how much space do you really need and what's your budget? How much can you really afford? Uh, if you are entering into a new lease and you're a new business, uh, you also need to factor in, you know, what is your startup time going to be uh, and at what point will you really reach, uh, you know, critical mass with your customers because you're not going to start out with 100% of your revenue from day one. So how much can you really afford? Where do you want to be, and how is the foot traffic and visibility of the retail space where you are right now? If you're a business that depends on walk-by traffic and walk-through, I really suggest that you go and you spend um, several days at different times of the day, different times of night, and see who's walking by, who are going to be your customers. Uh, this is really, really important. We recently worked with someone who uh, opened up a restaurant only to find out that she opened up her restaurant in a place where there was um, no foot traffic. And so the folks that she was counting on to actually come and eat lunch there never showed up. And um, unfortunately, she defaulted on her lease and had to close. Think also about uh, the type and the length of the lease. You know, are you just trying this out? Because if you are, then maybe subleasing or doing a pop-up shop is better before you enter into something long-term or something that you're going to put a lot of investment in. At the same time, if you're planning to open up a cafe or a restaurant and, you know, put $150,000 or $250,000 into a build-out, you really want a long-term lease so that you can amortize out the, um, your expenses and make sure that you're getting good value there. Think about uh, in your lease, what are your options that you can extend at a certain price or at a certain rate, um, and how are you going to exercise those options when your lease ends? Also, can you assign your lease if you sell your business? Can you sublet? Uh, what are the requirements there? And finally, will the landlord offer concessions, such as you know, free rent for a length of time while you're getting started, uh, funds for capital improvements that you are putting into your uh, space, but which when you leave that space, belong to the landlord. So for instance, an ADA bathroom that here in San Francisco, you know, costs at minimum $30,000 to put in, you know, when you leave your space in 10 years, you know, you're not taking that bathroom with you. 
Um, if you put in a, a flu and you know a, a hood for your restaurant, and your flu extends seven stories, and you yourself have paid you know for the sheet metal and the HVAC guy to put that flu in, you know that belongs to the landlord, and that's a great bonus for them the next time the next tenant comes in. So when you are working on your lease, all these things are negotiable, and you know, this puts you in a position where you can really set things out and explain, you know, your value to your landlord and negotiate all of these things. Could you uh, go to the next thing? Thank you. From the landlord's perspective, because it takes two to tango, um, you know, the landlord has certain things that they take into consideration. So first they look and they think, well, you know, is the use that you're looking for acceptable to the landlord? Um, and let me tell you a story about this. One of our clients that we're working with um, is a dry cleaner. And uh, we helped this dry cleaner to secure his lease about, uh, gosh, eight to 10 years ago. And then we recently helped him to extend his lease uh, for a couple more years before he retires. And then recently, this client reached us and he said, you know, um, I've been approached by someone and uh, they, wanna, they wanna buy my lease. They wanna buy my, my business and uh, take over my lease as it is. And we said, well, you know, that's really great. And he said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm ready to retire now. So, you know, this, this is good. Can you talk to the landlord? And uh, so we reached out to the landlord and the one thing that the business hadn't shared was he said, well, you know, it's a, it's a, a pharmacy that wants to come in here. And we thought, well, that's interesting. What kind of pharmacy? And it turns out the pharmacy that wanted to come in uh, was an MCD, a medical cannabis dispensary. And the landlord said, absolutely not. I, I don't want to have this kind of business in my uh, property. So you need to, and it's the landlord's right to determine what kind of business they're going to allow to operate in their property. So when you are proposing your business and at least to the landlord, you know, you want to be upfront. What kind of business are you going to be? Um, and are you going to stay that kind of business? So you can't come in and say that you're going to be a gym and then open up as, you know, a liquor store or open up as an MCD. Uh, also, the landlord wants to know, do you have the financial qualification uh, to actually pay the rent? And, you know, can you pay the rent? You need to show the documentation that support your candidacy as a tenant. Do you have the tax returns, your statements of financial worthiness? If you are going to get a loan to uh, do your build out, can you prove that uh, you have secured that, um, that the, the financial ability to do it? So you may not have the loan right now, but do you have a letter from your financial institution saying, yes, when so-and-so secures their lease, we will give them a loan for $100,000. Do you have a note that will show this? Uh, if you are intending to work with partners, you are also going to need to show their, their financial worthiness. Uh, if you are going to borrow money from your family, uh, then you may have to show a note from your family member and show their financial qualification. So, you know, all of these things the landlord needs to know because the landlord wants to make sure that when you are in your space, that you're gonna be there. There's a cost to the landlord for you know, renting out the space, and it's important that, that they're able to recoup those costs. Finally, think about the terms. Um, sometimes the landlord says, well, you know, uh, I'm only gonna keep this building for a couple more years, so you know, I'm going to only do a short-term lease. Or the landlord says, you know, I'm planning on developing this space, so you need to know that going in, I'm gonna give you a lease for X amount of years and no option. Or the landlord says, hey, you know what, I'm holding on to this building in perpetuity, I'm passing it on to my family, and you can say, great, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, let's have a really long-term relationship here. Um, and that's important too. You want to be really clear with your landlord how long of a term do you need, and in return, your landlord needs to also be really clear about how long of a term are they willing to give to you. Okay, next slide, please. So we get this question all the time. How do I know what's fair? Right? Everyone wants to say, well, gosh, you know, it seems like my, my rent is really expensive or, you know, I got a really great rate. But how do you really know if you've got a great deal or not? Um, you know, rents vary greatly. They're all over the map. It's kind of like your salary, right? And in this case, information is your very, very best friend. 
sometimes people don't want to talk about the uh, their lease terms. Uh, sometimes people want to hold this uh, this private. But honestly, the more information you can get, the better off you are going to be, and the better off your neighboring businesses are going to be, because your information is your negotiating power. That being said, rents vary greatly, right? There are lots and lots of different factors involved in turning, you know, the length of the lease, the location of the space, the side of the street you're on, if you're on a corner or if you're in the middle of the block, um, you know, what sort of tenant improvements are you going to make? What sort of capital will you be investing? And then also, what's the landlord situation? We always, always, always recommend that businesses work with a commercial real estate agent who knows the market, uh, if that's possible. And the reason why I say, you know, if possible, we put a little star here, is because commercial real estate agents work on commission. And it's really important that they feel like they're going to get a good value and be compensated fairly for the work that they're going to put into securing you a lease. Sometimes, um, you know, it, it's a huge effort and a huge amount of time involved in putting together a lease. And if it doesn't pan out, then that real estate um, agent, you know, doesn't make their commission. So we always advise that folks work with commercial real estate agents um, because they have a wealth of information, a wealth of resources uh, to help you. They can really help you to negotiate your lease and help you to look out for things that um, a layperson may not know. Keep in mind that uh, also in terms of determining your fair rent, that actually the price per square foot tends to decline with the size of the lease space. So if you have a large space, say you know 5,000 square foot, the cost per square foot um, usually goes down in relation to the size. So smaller spaces are higher management costs for the landlord because if the landlord has a 5,000 square foot space and it's divided into five different units, then that's five individual businesses that the landlord has to collect rent from, has to deal with their issues. From a landlord's perspective, it's a lot easier for them to deal with one person or one entity than five. So your landlord is thinking at it from that point. However, um, small spaces can also be the bane of a landlord's existence, right? If they only have 100 square feet and they really need to get it rented, um, then this is where you and your business being flexible become a great friend of the landlord. Uh, and you can say, hey, you know what? I can make this space work. And um, that's a wonderful thing for both you and the landlord. So if you can be flexible with a funky shaped space, uh, it puts you in a real uh, great place to be. Okay, next slide, please. So there are different types of leases, and lots of times folks don't know this, uh, especially if, if uh, you know, you as the business owner are, you know, negotiating your lease on your own. So basically, there are three different kinds. There's the triple net lease, where you pay a, a pro rata share of the property taxes, the property insurance, and possible other charges. All of this is laid out in your lease, and it's really important that you know what you are going to be on the hook for. Uh, there's industrial growth, which basically is like your flat rent. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I pay $2,000 a month for 1,200 square feet, and I pay the utilities, the trash, and the janitorial. That seems pretty simple. Uh, and then there's full service leases, um, but this is typically uh, more common with office leases in high-rise multi-tenant buildings, you know, where the landlord pays for everything, like the property tax, the insurance, utilities. Let me go back and talk to you about um, a triple net lease. When we say that you're going to be responsible for a proportionate share of the property taxes and um, insurance and other charges. The reason why this is so important to know is that you want to know, you know, if you are in a triple net lease, something that you need to know is what is the tax basis for the building? Are you paying taxes on a building that, uh, you know, last time it was sold, it was at a million dollars? What happens if that building is sold for $6 million? What happens to your rent? Are you responsible for paying the pro rata share on the purchase price of the original building when you signed your lease? Or is that going to go up because the building itself has been sold? Um, we have several instances where we have um, helped businesses to renegotiate their leases because they were in a sort of lease where they paid a pro rata share of property taxes or a pro rata share of utilities uh, only to find out that, you know, there weren't separate water meters or the 
Um, there were clauses in the lease that if the building is sold, then you know their rent will go up, you know, sixfold. So it's really important again that you work with a commercial real estate uh, agent who can help you to negotiate these and play through these different scenarios for you. Because you know if your rent suddenly goes up six, you know, six hundred percent, and your clients are not coming in, you know, at six times the number of clients that you have or your revenue, what are you going to do? You know, it's like your your lease is going to put you out of business. So you really need to uh, be aware of all of that fine print uh, before you go. Okay, next one, please. So before you sign a lease, uh, you want to work with a real estate agent to submit a letter of intent. A letter of intent is, um, it, it kind of allows you to be engaged, right? You really like this person, you're thinking about let's get married. This allows you the time to have thoughtful negotiation and information gathering. Uh, it's non-binding. So, you know, you're not legally held to this. But what this says is, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Landlord, I really want this space. And, you know, please don't talk to anyone else for 30, 45, 60 days while I have the chance to bring in my contractor, my architect, uh, to really find out what's it going to cost me to do this build out. Um, in a letter of intent, you lay out your proposed terms, you know, your length of the lease, your options when you want to extend it, uh, what sort of improvements are you going to make, what is the value to the landlord of those improvements, because all of that then becomes negotiable uh, when you determine what the actual cost of your uh, rent is going to be. And then you put in here what sort of concessions you want the landlord to make. Um, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, you know, because I am going to be putting in an ADA bathroom and a hood, uh, which will cost me, you know, $150,000, what are you going to do for me, you know, to make this up? How, how can we work together so that this becomes a win-win uh, for both parties? And so you put all this in your LOI. The LOI can go back and forth and back and forth uh, a couple of times, uh, but you always want to sit down at the table, have these conversations, then put it in writing, then have the negotiations in writing so that you know what you're referring to and that you don't have a he said, she said, and you're not relying on faulty memory uh, before you actually put all of these things into lease terms. Next one, please. Aha. The other thing that you want to do while you are in your LOI engage stage is do your homework. Contact the planning department, and we cannot overemphasize this enough. Find out, is the type of business that you want to open allowed here? Check the zoning. If you want to open up a fitness studio, is a health wellness studio allowed here? If you want to open up a cafe uh, and turn this into a food establishment, and if you want to have a serve beer and wine, are you allowed to get a beer and wine or a liquor license here? And if so, what kind of liquor license are you allowed to apply for? Do you need to do neighborhood notification um, because you are changing the use of your uh, of this space? When you do do the neighborhood notification, how long is that going to take? Is that a 30-day process? Is that a 60-day process? Um, all of these things are very important to find out because all of these things will cost you money uh, if you sign a lease and then it turns out that you're not able to do what you were hoping to do. We recently had the case where um, a client came to us and said, gosh, you know, I've signed this lease um, and I'm ready to go, but it turns out there's a notice of violation on this building, which is the landlord's responsibility, um, but no one knew that. And the client was trying to pull permits so that he could put in a uh, cafe. But before he could pull permits to put in a cafe, he needed his landlord to clear up the notice of violation, which was years old, for work that had been done on this historical building without a permit. So suddenly we have our client who had been paying rent on a space that he went into a lease and then he couldn't do his build out um, as a result of something that was totally beyond his control. Finally, you want to secure your estimates from a qualified contractor and architect if major renovations are required. Get those estimates in writing. Um, and we always recommend that when you get your estimates, add on another 30 to 40 percent of what that actual cost is going to be. Um, because timelines go long, um, expenses go up, and you really want to know realistically what is this going to cost you before you are able to open the doors. Next slide, please. 
we covered some of this. When you secure your lease, you're going to need your capital, uh, startup costs plus six months rent. Uh, and that six months rent will carry you through uh, before you really start to build some foot traffic and have a lot of your regular clients. We also suggest, of course, that you have your business plan, your executive summary, that you have your pro forma, your business pro forma, and your financials. Also, um, include for the landlord some examples of the visuals of how you want your store to look. Um, this allows you to have stronger negotiation uh, when you're planning to do your, your build out. The landlords go, wow, you know, I really like this space, and I want this ice cream store, and I love their branding, and I love the ideas they have, and this would be great for me as a landlord to have a wonderful business like this in my building. So having visuals are great because people are visual. Uh, and it's helpful for people to understand, you know, what's your vision of the space so that your landlord understands where you're coming from. Have a very clear budget, have your tax returns, have your proof of insurance and proof of income, and above, well, together with all of this, get your business insurance as soon as you possibly can. Make sure that when you get your business insurance that you speak to your insurance broker and find out, you know, not only what are you covered for in terms of, you know, theft, um, or, you know, what happens if there is an earthquake, right? What happens if there's flooding? Say if you're a, a jeweler and the, um, there's flooding in the, in the residential place above you, and all of your uh, inventory is great, right, because it's jewelry. So it all got wet, but it survived. But the repair to your space, because it was terribly flooded, is going to take three months. And through no fault of your own, now you're forced to be closed for three months. How are you going to recoup that lost revenue of three months of forcing to be closed, even though your inventory is okay, but your business cannot be open? You want to talk to your um, insurance broker about this, because there are things that you can do, and you can ask for uh, certain kinds of insurance of, you know, no-fault closure insurance, you know, um, things like that. Make sure that you... Uh, look into your insurance and find out what your options are so that you as a small business uh, can be aware of, uh, you know, things that can happen, acts of God, acts of plumbing uh, beyond your control that will affect whether or not your business can be open for a certain amount of time. Go on, please. If you have a lease that's expiring, and uh, again, we always recommend that you consult with a commercial real estate agent so that you can gather information about comparable um, properties nearby, for your renegotiation. Here is your opportunity where information is power, right? You want to know, what are the other guys down the street paying? What are the guys, you know, um, you know, on the next block paying? Um, you know, has your neighborhood changed or improved and, you know, drastically, right? All of these things are variables that are taken into consideration when you're renegotiating your lease. Update your business plan. Um, when you are thinking, hey, you know, now I've been here five years, I really want to be here another 10, do you have plans for changes that you're going to make to the space? You want to bring those plans to your landlord to show to them the extra value that you are going to be bringing to their physical space. And always, always, always exercise your option in writing within the designated time that is specified in your lease. If you have an option to extend your lease, and we always recommend that businesses put these options to extend within their lease. So you could say, I'm taking a lease for five years now, and five years from now, I want to be able to have the option to continue my lease at these particular terms. When you put that into your lease, it will also say that you need to exercise your option, say within 45 to 60 days of your lease expiring. And you gotta do that in writing. There, at least here in San Francisco, there is no commercial rent control. So if you mess up and if you don't exercise your option in writing or if you do it on the 46th day and you're supposed to do it within 45 days, your landlord can say, I'm so sorry, you didn't exercise your option in time. And now all of your hard work, all of your investment that you have put into your, your business is gone because you missed your chance. So I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of having an option in your lease and exercising your option in writing within the designated time as it specifies so that you don't lose your opportunity there. You always, always have the right to have your lease reviewed by an attorney. Your lease is a legally binding agreement and it's really important that, uh, you know, if you have any questions, if you have any doubts, if you want to find out what does this really mean, have your lease reviewed by an attorney. 
you have the right to say to your landlord, you know what, I need a couple of days. Thank you so much. I want to have my legal guy take a look at this just to make sure that, you know, I've covered all my bases. Take it as a red flag. If your landlord says, nope, take it or leave it, you know, you might want to really walk away because who knows what's in that lease that you as a layperson might not know. It is really important to have your lease reviewed by an attorney. Uh, we always recommend that to our clients. And at Urban Solutions, we offer referrals to legal services for entrepreneurs um, who are a service who provides low cost or free services for, uh, for many small businesses. And probably in your area, if, uh, if you do not have a business attorney, you probably also have uh, an organization like Legal Services for Entrepreneurs that will review your lease and provide you with advice on your lease. Um, I think that that brings us to the end here because uh, hopefully by now uh, you're ready to open for business. Um, I'm ready to answer any questions and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to our presentation. Thank you. Fantastic, Lisa. Thank you very much. I, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure the, the folks on the phone did. The For me, what, what really stood out was um, you know about the the different lease types and some of the nuances there that that were new to me i'm sure new to folks on the on the webinar today as well so um, a few questions came in so anybody who wants to ask a question there's a q a button on your dashboard go ahead type something in and i'll make sure to uh read it off to, to lisa so we have a, a few that came in already um so here's one, it, it talks about the options to the leases like, you know, like similar to what I was talking about and says, um, you said that uh, we could negotiate some options into a lease agreement. What are some examples of options that could be built in? Sure. Okay. That's a great question. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie. And thanks whoever asked that. So uh, some examples of an option uh, that you could ask for, well, for instance, first, when you, when you do your lease, right, typically every year, your the you know, the dollar amount of your lease goes up by, you know, you know, the CPI, a couple percentage points, right? When you write your lease and you say, this is a five-year lease and, you know, for year one, my rent is uh, $1,000 a month. For year two, my rent is, a, you know, $1,000 a month plus 2% more than that. So what is that? 1,020 I was an English major, so, you know, um, and then it, it compounds, right? Or, you know, how, however you and your, uh, you know, real estate uh, agent have written the lease. But then you could also put in there and say, well, at the end of five years, when I'm paying, you know, $1,700 a month, um, I want to extend my lease for another five years. So year six is going to be at uh, $1,900 a month. Year seven will be at $1,000, you know, $2,000 a month, right? You can lay that out, um, you know, in there. So you can specify the exact dollar amount. You can also specify a not to exceed dollar amount um, if you do percentages. Uh, some folks like to do fair market value, um, which in my mind is not really such a great deal at all because if your landlord says, well, you know, to me, uh, fair market value is $40,000 a month for this thousand square foot place, right? That's the landlord's perception of fair market value. Um, and if you try to come back and negotiate it and say, well, actually, you know, it's, it's really only, you know, $1,800 a month, you're pretty far away. You know, you're, you're pretty far apart from each other. So um, fair market value is kind of risky. And so that's why we always recommend, you know, if you can to put the dollar amounts in there. But when you do that, you're also taking the chance that what if the market tanks, right? Then you're going to have to go back and try to renegotiate that as well. So uh, another question came in, um, who pays the brokerage fees? Right, so uh, the property owner uh, typically pays the brokerage fees. So, um, and that's why, you know, sometimes if you're looking at a small space, that's, that's why I said, you know, it's really important that when you're working with a commercial realtor, um, because they're compensated on commission, right? So they need to make sure that it's worth their while. Um, so sometimes if, you, if you're in there and you're negotiating on your own, right? Um, then you definitely want to have an attorney look at your lease too, right? Um, because if there's, you know, if you're just dealing with, you know, Mr. Smith and you guys are doing it on your own and you're doing it on faith, you know, that's great. But in the end, you know, even if you're using a, you know, a, a lease agreement document that, you know, comes from Office Depot or whatever that you download off the web, you know, you want someone else to review that and to make sure that 
all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted. Um, so yeah. Yeah, well, it's great to know that the real estate agent fees are, are paid by the, the landlords or a small business owner. Well, it doesn't have to be a yeah. to engage. Yeah, no, typically, typically that's that's how it works. Great. So, and you know, it, it, that's that's how how the realtors get a listing agreement. You know, is they they negotiate that with the property owner. Wonderful. And you know, if another question is, if I plan to grow and I sign a lease with some extra space. Uh, that I plan to use, I'm assuming they mean, you know, they plan to use later on for themselves. Can they sublease it in the meantime? Again, that's, uh, that's what you would negotiate with your landlord in the lease, right? And the leasing, a typical, uh, you know, a, a typical blanket lease that you would get, you know, from Home Depot, not Home Depot, Office Depot, I'm sorry, you know, or online, you would have clauses, right? You know, your standard clauses about subleasing, your standard clauses about if you sell your business. Um, typically, you know, the landlord, um, it's up to the landlord to decide if they will allow you to sublease or not. Um, definitely, though, if you choose to go that way, whoever you sublease to, you know, you are ultimately responsible for them paying the rent, right? So you're responsible for their nut. So you would want to make sure that they have their financial security, that you know you run a credit report, that they're good for their money, that you know, because it's it's, it's your lease, right? So even if your landlord um, allows you to sublet, it's your responsibility to pay that nut every month. So you know, don't depend on someone to do that for you. That's an excellent point, right? If I sublease, you know, a third of the unit, uh, and and that that uh, subtenant doesn't pay, I'm still on the hook for it. You're on the hook. You're on the hook. It's a legally binding document. You are on the hook for that. Yeah. 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 Um, and then similarly, uh, you know, if I sell my business, um, what happens to my lease then? Right. That's a good question too. So, you know, one of the reasons when we started this out and we said that your lease is your asset, right? Um, you know, your lease really is worth something. Right. And if you have a lease that uh, has great lease terms and someone says, oh, my gosh, you know, I want to come in and I want to buy your business and you've got 10 years left on the lease, um, you know, that's worth something to people. Right. So, again, you want to make sure that in your lease agreement that you are allowed to sell your business. This is also, you know, put out in your lease agreement. Typically, the and, and, and there are also clauses in there that say that, you know, the landlord cannot refuse something that's reasonable. Right. So if you're a cafe and you want to sell your business and another cafe says, oh, I want to come in, you know, as long as that cafe owner shows that they've got, you know, the financial wherewithal and they're able to do it, then that's a reasonable reason, right? And the landlord should not uh, refuse that reasonable request, right? But, you know, if it's a cafe and suddenly, you know, you say, well, I want to open up, um, gosh, I don't know, like, like an adult bookstore, right? The landlord can say, yeah, I'm not so down with that. Um, and I, I, I don't want to sell it that way. So <laughs> Fantastic. I, I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking of things that, you know, instances that we've run into, <laughs> you know, that that's the thing. And you guys are the experts at urban solutions and you've seen everything. So, uh, we've seen know. many things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why you're a great resource for the people in the business advising.org network and for small businesses around the country um, because you've your experience and you've seen a lot of things and I'd like to thank you Lisa for this fantastic webinar I know I learned a lot I'm sure everyone else did I'd like to thank everyone who participated today uh, and who logged in and is watching the recording of this and um, please visit us at businessadvising.org if you'd like a, a one to one mentor um, and connections to fantastic organizations like Lisa at Urban Solutions thank you everybody thank you Thank you, and thank you, everybody, too. Thank you, Ellie, for, for hosting me. Thank you.